Good evening. I'm Dr. Tammy Hotchkiss and I'm the curator at the Origins Centre. Our talks and lec lectures at Origins focus not only on the latest scientific and archaeological research, but also on exploring current social issues, cultural norms and perceptions which are often rooted in the past. We want to provide a platform to celebrate and explore Southern African cultures. We have worked with Dr. Kirti Ranchot on various talks in the last few years around mental health, wellness and different cultural approaches to medicine and healing. And we're delighted to partner, partner with Kirti again, now in the virtual realm, on a series of talks, Healthy Aging and the Brain, Tapping into Our Cultural Capital. In each talk, Kirti will be joined by artists, musicians, poets, academics and thought leaders to discuss the power of art in its many forms and how art can help maintain good mental health. These talks are sponsored by the Dana Foundation. I will now introduce Kirti and our guest for today, multi-talented musician Bongiwe Lusizi. Kirti Ranchod is a neurologist and Atlantic Fellow focusing on brain health. Her expertise is on promoting brain health by making the latest research practical. This is in order to reduce the risk of illnesses such as stroke, dementia, depression and anxiety, which are increasing worldwide, and to promote health. Her approach includes creativity, calm, self-awareness and focus as essential elements for a healthy brain. Her interests include the role of traditional practices in promoting health, neuroaesthetics and understanding the different perceptions of memory. Bongiwe Lusizi, also known as Mtwakazi, is from the Eastern Cape in South Africa. She is an Nkosa opera singer, songwriter and performer. She has pioneered the new opera music genre, which synthesizes African bow music, classical music, opera, choral music, and African dance rhythms. At the heart of the genre is the continent-wide calabash bow, Iselwa. Mtwakazi is also a healer and jewelry designer. In 2018, she joined the Ntinga Ntaba Gandoda rural movement in order to create establish a creative academy to promote popular education, compositions and performances of African bow music. It also promotes arts, craft, dance, poetry and creative writing and has offered collaborations in interpreting the 19th century history of resistance to colonial invasion. This work is part of a progressive people's heritage movement built from below as a contribution to post-apartheid social cohesion, black identity and decolonization. The Academy offers training to high school learners in bow music and instrument making, voice training, basic music education, performance and choreography. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Over to you, Kirti. Thank you for the introduction, Tammy. And this is the third in our series of talks and our second musician. We will continue beyond this as well. This is an important discussion for us to have. My focus is on brain health, how to keep the brain healthy in order to reduce certain illnesses and so that we function better in the world. And what are the skills we need to develop in order to function better in the world, in order to live in a way that promotes health? But this series of conversations is actually about what we already have potentially in our traditions, our cultures, our ways of living and knowing, which support health. And by that, I mean, allows us to function in the world in a healthy way, in a way that allows us to grow and to thrive. And, you know, it, it is really to stimulate a discussion on our traditions, our cultures, our cultural capital, an inheritance that we have passed down through generations. It includes the art forms, but it extends beyond that. Because the arts, whatever they have been, visual art, storytelling, theater, music or dance, is not separate from our traditions, our cultures, our ways of living. Art is not simply placed in a gallery. Plays are not only performed in a theater. 
or music in a concert hall. They really are integrated into our ways of living. And then if you look at it, how do they support health? How can they potentially keep us mentally engaged, promote social cohesion, allow us perhaps to sleep better by helping us to deal with our anxiety and giving us the tools for relaxation, the tools to handle all those negative thoughts that circle in your head. Within our cultures and traditions, are there resources that we can tap into which stimulate critical thinking, empathy, creativity, and more, all necessary for health, for healthy living, healthy aging, healthy societies? So that is what I'm trying to understand and appreciate with the series of discussions. And hopefully also understand how to nurture our cultural capital so that it grows in order to support us, support our health, support the health of our society. With that, I'm going to be joined by Bongiwe, an inspiring and inspired woman. I hope you enjoy the discussion. Please share your thoughts, your comments as we go along. I would love your insights on this. Thanks. And let's begin. Hi, Bongiwe. I'm so happy that you could join me today. And I'm looking forward to the discussion we're going to have on music and health and healthy aging. How are you? I'm good, uh, Kirti. Thank you. Um, and thanks uh, for considering uh, me to be part of uh, this conversation because uh, it's very important, uh, not just with what we're going through uh, currently in the country, and more especially when it comes to gender-based violence, uh, which I think also, you know, it's also triggered by people not being able to heal, you know, and not even understanding what healing is, you know. So, yeah, this is why I'm happy and, yeah, I'm good as well. <laughs> I seem to forget how to ask people if they are also fine, if someone <laughs> asks me. <laughs> I am very good. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes um, I just jump and, and talk for long. So you have to, like, remind me to kind of slow down. <laughs> I'm happy mm -hmm. to listen. Um, I was very intrigued by the work you're doing and the community-based work that you're doing and how you're doing it and your approach to using music. Do you want to just fill us in a little bit about that? So, um, what, I mean, my history, um, personally, from where I come from, I grew up in a typical, you know, set-up township in Tanzania, uh, according to the statistics, they say it's the second biggest township of the Soweto. Oh. So I was raised by both my parents, my dad, who served a vehicle company for 20 years, and my mom, who for 21 years, she was a housewife. So my infant stages, uh, early childhood, I was always surrounded by music. Music from Fela Kuti, Miriam Makeba, uh, like my dad, actually, both my dad, both my parents, you know, are music lovers. Ah. And I remember it was compulsory every, almost every Sunday, you know, from 8 until 2 a.m. And remember, you have to go to school on Monday. So we'd watch like documentaries um, and uh, films uh, of music. And um, so we grew up dancing, you know, my sister was still alive then. So we are a very musical family, though none of my family members like really uh, approach music professionally, you know. So my gift and my talent uh, started showing up when I was in high school. So we would, I would sing for the choir, started joining the choir. And every time we'd have like people visiting to come and help us and assist us with the music, there was something about my voice, you know. And uh, one of my teachers convinced me if I should start singing solo. 
And I was like, no ways, I'm going to die. <laughs> so it so happens that, um, so part of the choir, there's a, there was a solo piece we were singing. Um, we used to call it a vernacular, the Western um, score. Mm -hmm. And we'd just say it's the Western, and then we'd sing songs in Africans. So the soloist that was singing contralto, which is the lowest uh, female voice, mm -hmm. her voice was gone just 10 minutes before we got on stage. And uh, we had to sing one by one. So when it came to me, I was so scared. I thought I was just gonna like just faint and, you know, see myself on the floor. But uh, as soon as I started opening my mouth, there was just like this quietness in the room. It felt like something was passing and it didn't feel bad or scary but an energy was there and it was present with all of us. Everybody started having goosebumps. I saw my teachers crying. I did not know if I was doing things right or wrong. Mm -hmm. So, but we didn't have enough time. So we quickly had to go and then I started singing uh, the solo and we got position one. It was all nice, went back home. Now the following day, all the choir conductors from all the other choirs started, started flocking at my house in the township. Everybody wanted a piece of me to come and join the choir. So luckily the choir was not far from where I stay. So I joined an adult choir from a very, very young age. And I was singing like with like really professional people who were like really tough on me, you know. They were not playing any games. So I started like continuing so singing solos. But now what I noticed when I started competing now singing mm -hmm, solos, mm -hmm. every time I would get in a room where there's a lot of people and I start singing, there was this quietness and this energy comes again. It just becomes silent and people would get goosebumps. I remember the MC said, you know, I would probably lose my job by saying this, but this lady who just left the stage now, she changed my life. I started having goosebumps. I'm not a crying, I'm not a cry baby, but I had some tears. I don't know what's happening. So growing up in that space, I didn't know about how a voice could heal, you know, how so a voice could heal. Stop you just one second and we will go into healing a little bit more. But mm -hmm. why did you take it up so much? Did it have an impact on you that you were aware of um, in terms of perhaps healing you without you even uh, being consciously aware of it? Did it make you feel better? Did it help your mood? Did it help your anxiety? Um, was there any benefit that you sought to yourself when you started? Oh, uh so, um, growing up listening to music uh, in a space where you are in a township, you have no choice. You can li listen to a, a kind of music that can really destroy you mentally, you know. Like, uh, we were listening to a lot of, like, music that was very, like, very much, like, carries, like, a vulgar language, you know. The, 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 the kind of style, how people dress up when they sing that uh, particular music. And most of the music was like more like American music, you know. And uh, for me, I didn't find healing in that okay. at all. It, it, it okay. used to distract me a lot. Until we went to a garage sale, me and my dad, every Saturday would have like... Oh, wonderful. Uh, we'd, we'd go to a garage sale and we'd find uh, a lot of like, like Germans moving out from East London, going back to Germany. So they would sell all their like uh, furniture, music, uh, vinyls. So my dad came across a, a, a cassette. We used to call them a cassette back in the day. Before the I, grew was I grew up yeah. with cassettes. I grew up with cassettes. Are we good? <laughs> yeah, and then you have this thing like you wind yes. them with a pen. <laughs> like you rewind it. <laughs> so I came across the La Caviata by Monteverdi, right? Ah. Listen to that music, Kirti. When okay. I listened to that music, I remember I had to close my eyes. There was something that the opera music did. You know, I just closed my eyes. I just feel so calm. And honestly, I was not conscious of that. But I was aware that, you know, every time I come back from school, I want to listen to that music because there's something that it does to me. And also, remember, I didn't grow up in a space whereby we were taught about the importance of those things. Mm. We're kind of going because we're doing what we love, you know, what resonates with us, you know. Mm, mm, so mm. I was also very attentive to sound, you know, mm. listening to birds, listening to, 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 to chickens in the morning, listening to dogs, listening. I was a very imaginary child. Like I would mm -hmm. even imagine what kind of a sound would come out 
from a combination of a sound of a chicken and a cow. You know, if I would, because a chicken is more soprano and ah. a cow is more, right? So I'm like, if I would turn animals into singers, so this would definitely, you know, so I grew up in, in that space, but it, I was not conscious of, you know, this is healing, this is calming me down, this is easing my nerves, but I would just close my eyes. And another thing that would happen, every time I listen to music, I would just have goosebumps and, and I would start, you know, like, you know, like my body would shiver and I don't know what would happen, you know, what was happening at that time, you know, only at a later stage now people meeting different spiritual people across the globe and they would explain what these things are to me and what these things mean to me. So it was, it was more like that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a, no, a, what a beautiful story in terms of um, finding the, the cassette with your dad and mm -hmm. the story with how you brought your environment in, in terms of the chickens and the characters they were in terms of this musical opera you <laughs> created in your imagination. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And as you carried on in this, you just, you, the healing power of music resonated. Right. And what did you find or how did you interpret music as being healing or why did you interpret music as being healing? So this is how things changed for me. So now I'm, I'm telling you a story about, say, <clears throat> early childhood to high school. Right. Mm, mm, mm. So from high school, I went to Forte. Mm -hmm. So already at high school, I joined uh, just to rewind a bit so I can connect to, to your question. Definitely. Definitely. So, so in high school, I, when I was doing standard six, I was called by a friend. She's like, he was like, Hey, did you see the newspaper? They're, they're having auditions at the Guild Theater. Mm -hmm. in me, I went there still too young. I went to the auditions and I, I, I met my voice teacher there and she's like, can you sing opera? I'm like, right. I've never heard about opera, but I have, I didn't, I didn't even know that listening to Verdi was opera. I didn't know right, that it was. Right, so right. I was so, and then she started playing a, a song, like, um, it's called Libiamo, mm -hmm. you know, so this song is playing, I'm like, oh, okay, this is similar to what I was listening to at home. And she's like, can you imitate this? And I said, yes. So I started singing. She's like, okay, you don't have, you won't get the job because you are still young, you know, mm -hmm. but when you are older, we would most definitely be more than happy to welcome here, to welcome you here. Me being me, I went there the following Saturday. <laughs> to, to to start you said, were older. I, said, I know, I know, but I, I, I want to sing, you know? Yeah. And she was like, okay, this one is not taking no for an answer. So I, I, I got the opportunity of being taught now, being trained, the voice being trained, the vocal vocabulary, the vocal diet, you know, how to take care of your voice in different climates, you know, when the climate is dry, what to do, what kind of food to eat, warm-ups, breathing, relaxation. I remember my voice teacher would always say, there is nothing in music without breathing. In fact, there is nothing in life without breathing. Everything starts and ends with breath. Every right, part, right. All, of, of, all of what our life is, is breath, mm. nothing else. You know? mm. And he was saying, it's amazing how we're so caught up in the world that we don't have time to breathe. And the only time we have to ourselves is when we are in the bathroom. That's mm -hmm. the only private time you can have to, to yourself these days. So the importance of breathing. And fortunately, my voice teacher was also a former lecturer at Rhodes University, but she, she retired because she, she was quite old. And then she said, should you be interested to continue uh, enhancing your skills in music or even studying music, you should mm -hmm. contact me because I was still doing my standard six at that time oh wow okay, so yeah. long story short i went to forte mm -hmm. in 2006 and this is how my life changed now like 360 degrees so i've been singing opera very convinced that i'm an opera singer sang all the voice categories from mezzo coloratura dramatic soprano soprano sprinter soprano i knew how to sing and express myself with everything so I come to Forte. Well, ideally, I wanted to go to UCT because I wanted to continue with the opera. Unfortunately, my parents could not afford to take me there. So I was like, okay, I'll go to university, went to Forte. When I got to Forte, the first thing I saw was a calabash. Right. And I'm like, I'm definitely at the wrong place. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, this is the Department of Music, I'm definitely at the wrong place. <laughs> and then I saw, I saw the bowls. And I'm like, these are the stuff that the koi people use and then 
uh, I came across uh, um, Dr. Alvin Peterson. Now he's the former HOD uh, from Forte. And he's like, no, 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 no. These are instruments, you know. So I started uh, off uh, very confused because now there's no opera in the school, you know. There's mm -hmm. only a school choir, which was a bit boring for me because mm. it was just like songs and it was just too crowded and too disorganized. I wanted to continue something for myself. So in June, uh, second semester, there's a guy that came to see me at the music department because I'll start, our classes would start at 8.55, but you'd find me at the music department at 7.30. Wow. Like it's either, um, the latest would be 7.30. I was just like playing the piano, not even knowing how to play it and just singing, having fun, you know, all by myself. So apparently he heard me. So, and then the department uh, called all of us as students and said, and, and then they, they said, they, we're going to have a new lecturer. She comes from UCT, you know, and her name is Tandile Mandela. And I'm like, oh, Tandile Mandela, is she the daughter of Nelson Mandela or anything? So they're like, yeah, she's, she is related, but let's do not focus on that now. Right. She's going to be teaching with traditional music, you know. So, and Tandile came in. And she sent this friend of mine to look for someone who can sing like Miriam Makeba. Ah. And, and this friend of mine says to me, ha, ah, I know someone, Bongi Wei sings like Miriam Makeba. I'm like, I don't sing like Miriam Makeba. I sing like me. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but anyway, long story short, so I went to her office and there were all these beautiful instruments. And that energy came back, that ah. silence. I was not singing this time around, but that thing came back, you know. And she said, hi, Bongiwe. I'm like, hello. And then she's like, have you seen these instruments before? I'm like, I've never seen these instruments in my own. I didn't even know that they're instruments. She's like, pick one from the wall. I picked one. She's like, take a stick. I took a stick. Can you pluck it? Started plucking it. And then it says, when you pluck it, you open and close, you open and close, you open and close. That's how I started playing. And then she's like, can you sing while you play? I said, I can try. Will you take the instrument to your room with you? And I said, yes. But now when I took the instrument in my room, that's when I started dreaming because I was not dreaming ah, at all. Right. Now I would dream about, you know, like old people passing, like a lot of water. That, that's what I, I started dreaming about, a lot of water, you know. Mm -hmm. I remember I had this dream. It was a series of like seven days, same dream. I'm in front of a river and there are all these pictures of, you know, reflecting reflected by the water the elders you know and i did not know what these things mean and i was covered with a red cloth it was like a hoodie like looking cloth and i had red ochre on my face mm -hmm. and i was carrying this instrument with me now when i looked up the mountain things were shaking you know and then i saw the president was there some graduates were there some nurses were there politicians were there healers were there like all sorts of different people dancing to one rhythm, you know? Right. So I would wake up all the time when I'm trying to get up and reach where the people are. So, so now this changes everything as soon as I touch this instrument, you know? And I start playing this instrument. I'm like, ah, I like the sound, but I don't know how to sing on top of it because I'm trained as an opera singer. I know all the standards of opera, but I, I don't know traditional music. So then now... I went back then, she gave me a CD. That's when I, I came across the music of the legendary of Finnish Ikwili. Uh, she's from Nopo um, village in, uh, in the Eastern Cape. She passed away in 2004. Mm -hmm. And when she passed away, she was 96. Wow. And all her life, all her life, yeah. all her life, when I mean all her life, all she did was to play that instrument wow. in all her songs. She shares this deep pain in her songs that says, meaning the others follows, the others follow and say water, meaning most of the time when this research, like these uh, researchers or like a, a lot of PhD students at the time would go into villages and experiment on this music, they would break the trance and they would actually separate ah. the artists from the people. And the beauty about traditional music, it's that it's about the people, it's not about an individual. So I started having this interest of like looking more between the uh, looking more deeper on what the difference is between the music industry and the music culture. But I mean mm. that can follow later in our conversation. But I just wanted to come to your question as into how this mm. how did I 
you know, start getting to know that now this music is different. You know, this mm, music mm. now is healing. So now this is what happens. So I would carry the bow proudly walking in town, going home when the schools are closed. And I would meet a lot of diviners, sangomas, healers on the streets. And then they said, they would always say to me, you know, you, you are a healer. And I'm like, healer, no ways. No healer. Healer is for people like you. Me, I'm a student at Forte, and I'm frustrated right now because I have to learn this instrument so I can go to my exams. So I started getting to know who I am through that instrument. It's music. It's music that showed me the way of who I am. Where do I come from? And then people would start telling me stories that this instrument was played by their grandmothers when they take their kids to sleep. They would sit around the Ronaville and then they sit around the fire. And then they kept on asking me, do you know of a lady called Matosini? Matos? And I'm like, I never met Matosini in my whole entire life. So this is how like briefly, how this whole shift from this high school kid, very confident of her opera, being an opera singer, trying to look, you know, the part, very Western, yes. into like 360 degrees to coming back to the roots of, where my ancestors were trying to draw my attention, you know, to, 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 to meeting these instruments. Mm. And ch the change did happen. So what I decided to do, I decided to call the music Corpera because geographically I am closer mm. from the Eastern Cape, right? And I have this background of opera. So I was like, okay, a closer woman and opera should be closer. Thing. <laughs> so then I started, because I was like, I'm not letting go of both. I'm going to take them and bridge them into one thing. So that's how the music came about, you know? So, yeah. yeah. That's actually a lovely story. And I think especially that learning this instrument that was connected to your community and culture actually taught you so much about yourself, more than going through the opera training. Um, mm -hmm. And that understanding, how did it help you going forward? Well, it helped a lot, uh, Kirti, but at the same time, it was very difficult for me, you know. Um, growing up in a space where you are deprived, your, your culture, you deprived mm. your heritage. Mm. You, I mean, I didn't choose to grow up in a township, you know. Mm. I cried myself most of the time because, you know, it felt like there's so much I needed to know and there's so much I didn't know. And the worst thing when my excitement was starting to rise. It was confusing because I couldn't find anyone in the village who know about this instrument. And I remember I used to, because uh, Forte is situated right at the heart of the village, you know, here in the Eastern Cape. So I used to travel long distances walking, finding old people who can still play this instrument so that they can teach me, not just like teaching me in the method system, like very school stuff, but I can have someone to hang around with and jam with. I was longing for that. I was longing for that comfort. I was longing for guidance, mm. but then I didn't have it, you know? Mm. So I kind of like had to figure things out my way, you know, until I started having a dream again. Ah. So I dreamt that I met a woman, a light skinned, like very like coy features. She was wearing like a, a duke like me, but it's green and an orange uh, dress, umpago, the traditional Kosa dress. And her door where I was knocking in the dream, it was green. So um, rewind a bit. Then unfortunately I had to drop out from Forte because I couldn't, my parents couldn't afford to pay my fees and everything was just messed up. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna go out there with this instrument and starting and start to launch myself, you know, out there to the world. So instead of going out to, to start a music career in Johannesburg, like your typical, you know, stories about artists leaving the Eastern Cape to go and be famous in Joseph Joburg recording music, I wanted to stay at home and start teaching children how to make their own instruments. But because I didn't have the resources, I didn't even know about the word funding at that time, I was just doing it out of my own heart. So I would share one instrument with the kids, have each child playing the instrument, form them into a small orchestra. We'd like collect like small stones, put them inside a bottle, start making our own shakers, like recycled materials, make sounds from twigs of trees, like 
plastics and all and all of that put them together so already you know i was shifting to to becoming someone now that is not just enjoying the music for herself but wanting to share and not really knowing that i am also going back to no finishes wish of music being shared by the people you know and then coming back to to how things changed i would always say to people it's not just about the instrument right it's about how the energies and the ancestors channel you to the instrument and how they want you to use the instrument as a weapon for change as a weapon for healing for people right because i could just do music to entertain myself you mm. know or to entertain people mm. but now this kind of music is like completely different you know right so um that's when i started knowing the purpose of me using music for healing and of mm. course after that we unfortunately lost our first uh, born son oh, who drowned sorry. in the swimming pool oh. and coming to that actually this now your question is that how did it all change mm. so coming to that my son's death became my spiritual awakening mm. because the day we buried our son i didn't think after that i started thinking differently about things i saw things differently i was in a very dark space i was hurting myself mm. i was drinking alcohol okay i was i was i was i was in a space where i wanted to completely completely destroy myself mm. and again the instrument was with me i never wanted anything to do with the instrument i was like anyways if it was in with this instrument i would still be singing my opera and i'll still be taken care of at the theater everything being done for me mm. is this instrument that created this wholeness because at the end of the day my son died because i was trying to go to joburg to make it and he was neglected in the space of that so i kept on blaming myself for all those things of course. and i was deeply i was drowning and drowning into depression mm. i feel like i had to go back and pick that instrument again you know of course and slowly connecting with it there was nothing else that could heal me the minute i pluck it i feel like i come down ah. i started listening to the kalabash and i'll start having these visions and hearing voices that are telling me everything is going to be okay you just need to accept that like your life is changing now mm. we are wanting to claim you and own you as our own child and we want you to go out there and tell the world about your experience you know and heal the world and i'm like i am not healed myself they say they said they said to me this is the reason why we bought you this instrument so that you can heal yourself first then you can be able automatically you going to be healing others you know so this i mean music changed my life it's a way of life it's not just music because it sounds good or the orchestration around it there is nothing that happens in my life that doesn't happen in music you know i have my highs i have my lows it's, sometimes it's a discord you know sometimes you know i don't really know if what i'm singing makes sense to the next person you know because all of my music i sing in the language and only to find out at a later stage you know how it changes me and how it changes other people that also the language doesn't matter because it's also music being a universal language where you can meet with people you've never seen before in your life but you could still connect through music you know so i mean it's a long story i could go for days and days but that's how the change began you know that there was a big shift just from high school to forte bridging opera with um traditional music and now traditional music taking over as a way of getting attention from my ancestors and my son dying and the death of my son becoming my spiritual awakening and since then i never looked back you know so i continue i thank you for sharing that story it really is profound and i think um all of us goes goes uh, go through these periods in our lives that where we just hit rock bottom and you tapped into you tapped mm-hmm. into your music to actually lift you up both to from what you're describing it helped your mood and helped you to sort of give you, it was like a guide to get you to a better place am i correct in in saying that most definitely yes Yes. So for people who are going through 
through uh, or uh, living through a particularly tragic period in their lives what advice would you give to them in terms of healing um either with or without music how how would you yeah how how would you advise people to tap into what they have internally because in essence it's tapping into what you, you have internally as well so how would i advise people to to get beyond a particularly tragic part in their lives oh i see i see okay i mean um your question moves me because it's kind of like uh uh my everyday life i spend every day thinking how do i draw people to a space of self forgiveness because mm-hmm. i think a lot of incidents that people go through it's hard for them to, to forgive themselves mm-hmm. we don't even want to go as far as moving on that's mm-hmm. too far mm-hmm. if you can't forgive yourself you are not any close to moving on mm-hmm. you know so and uh, so i started an idea of uh, healing self first and coming from just being an artist uh, purely art not no activism no political stuff academic stuff and then uh, eventually i came a lot of across a lot of uh, political activists feminists you know i would just say activists and i realized actually like my partner being an act, a political activist himself is that these people have a lot of depression mm-hmm. and they're hiding it behind their you know status portfolios you know prof something doctor something so and so and you could see deep in this person's eye that this person is struggling and this person is depressed Mm-hmm. And then coming back to it, how do you use music to facilitate this process in terms of both understanding self, self forgiveness, and possibly healing beyond that? So um, I will start it from like um, uh, the calabash. Mm-hmm. So going back to the calabash, so it's the first object I met. So. just the calabash alone before we go to music mm-hmm. so the calabash mm-hmm. is got so many different uses uh, as um, i thought first it was a continental continental object that symbolizes unity only to find out that it's actually very much universal you know so um, we as people sometimes have the understanding that music is sound but sometimes music is silence you mm-hmm. know there's a lot of silence there's a lot of sound in silence mm-hmm. Mm. you know so the calabash uh from growing it uh it grows for 6 months uh here in uh, in in well, I'll say in Africa well in South Africa specifically we grow it in we plant it in October uh latest November and then you harvest in May so the calabash you can eat uh, uh as like for its nutritional value you can make it into a smoothie you can dry the seeds and have them as a cereal you can store water you can store herbs when you take off a, a twig of like an olive tree i don't know what it's called but then you put milk into the calabash and then you start stirring it up and then your your milk will never go sour so with and then the same calabash now now we come into music the very same calabash you turn it into an instrument like if you look at instruments like kora the one that uh, um um he plays it so beautifully uh, but Pops, Pops. Pops. same same uh, calabash uh, but calabashes that size would grow in places like mali uh, so there's and, and in places like more humidity and the, where there's more rain because it grows where there where there's like lots of rain right and then from the same calabash so i dry it and then when i dry it i open a hole at the top and then open a hole at the back and then insert it and 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 connect it together with the stick pull up the string tie it together and then that would that's how i make the instrument so from the primary sector which is growing it drying it and fashioning it now it comes to music right and then when it's music 
how does it heal people? It heals people the calabash as an object itself because the process of planting is healing as well. Mm, because I agree. Uh, unfortunately, people like to jump into music, but I mm. want to take people into the actual healing of mm. the seed mm. beyond the seed of the calabash. Very valid. Thank because you for. Not, yeah, Thank because you for not all that. of us would be musicians. Mm. Some of us would be agro. I, I'm I'm still grappling with something that I'm calling agro musicology, where we use permaculture. As wow. you know, people who specific children who specifically want to 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 specialize in growing calabashes for those who want to make music for them. Wow, of Not course. Necessarily looking at being musicians, mm. you know. Mm. So I use um, music now for healing, not just for sound, but speech, because music helps you with a lot of speech exercise. And I would firstly, in my class now, I'm, I'm, I'm giving you an idea what, of what happens in my class, the whole healing process. So we first start with a physical exercise. We haven't touched any music or any sound or any instrument from the head, opening up all the chakras, you know, the chest, right. open up, going down to the belly, connecting your breath with your spine and breathing in, breathing out, stretching the legs, stretching the the whole body and then you feel the body is fine and then after that we go specifically to breathing and the breathing has got nothing to do with the physical exercise how we hold the breath and let it out slowly in and out in and out because now you're opening up your chest you're opening up your vocal cords you're warming up right and most importantly what i found out according to me being a vocalist as well is that my voice start opening up around 10, 10 a.m. That's when it starts, you know, opening up a little bit. So I wouldn't dare to wake up and just go straight into singing. So this is now everything I do taking my class. When I mean a class, it could be any, it could be any movement or any organization or anyone who actually invites me to come and do the workshops in their space. But uh, particularly in the village where I am, this is how we follow, you know, our schedule. So from the breathing, and then I use uh, what I call a voice warm up, which is very important because now if you see the vibrations in your vocal cords, mm -hmm. so they go like this, then they vibrate until they are warm. So hence, I always advise people when they warm their voice, they must start closing their mouth and go, mm. because there's something in that mm, when you open, when you close your mouth and the sound just it doesn't just resonate in your ears but it opens up as well you know and you feel covered you feel warm you know you feel for me i feel present you know right, right. and then right after that we do a speech exercise so we take like uh tongue twisters like peter piper picked a pack of pickled peppers if peter piper picked a pack of pickled peppers where is the pack of pickled peppers Peter Piper picked? Right. It's fun. Because it's why? It brings a lot of laughter. Mm. Because other people will say, Peter, pizza, brought yes. a box. <laughs> and I'm like, where is the box now? You know? So you, you'd find, you know, also it releases a lot of tension. We haven't even started singing, you know. We haven't even started thinking about singing, you know. But by the time we go into the song, I first unpack, like for instance, say it's me now performing in front of an audience. I would tell them what this song is, what it means mm -hmm. to me from the word, from the eye and what it means to me reflecting from where I come from and where I am, you know? So then it's only then I will start singing. And then when I finish singing the song, I would always make sure that people join me to sing the song with. And I create in music choruses that are very easy to follow. And then people would jointly sing. Then I make the people clap. And then I say, if you are comfortable, you want to get up, take off your high heels, pull out your hair, you know, do whatever you want to do, come and join me. But you'd find that the whole room is so relaxed because now it has not just started from the sound being a sound. It's that whole process of preparing the body and the respect of the fact that still the body exists beyond the voice because the voice 
is so much 100% part of the body. So they work hand in hand, you know. So this is the healing process. This is how I use music as healing, you know, taking through those processes, you know. And then after that, I will do a Q&A. So basically, I'll do a Q&A that I will actually turn it the other way around where people ask me questions, then I ask them questions back. Because in most cases, you are the one that knows, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, me, as for me, I'm like, uh -uh, we all know. And we know in different ways. So I don't know if at least what I've, you know, tried to explain to you how, you know, it takes you to the process of how do I use music, you know, to heal other people, you know. So, I think there's so much value in what you're doing also. And I, I mean, you know that already, but just listening to you and listening to the process and how well thought out it is from the understanding of the importance of the seed and growing, because there's a whole lot of literature now in terms of the impact nature has on our mental health and our sense of well-being. But you're not telling people to go spend time in nature. You're giving a very, very practical activity and at the same time, empowering activity because you can use this calabash for so many different things that are relevant, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm, and then mm -hmm, the whole process mm -hmm. in terms of processing emotions, becoming self-aware, and then tapping into music to actually facilitate um, the process of healing. Uh, it's just mm -hmm. so beautiful. I can't wait until I can actually attend <laughs> a <laughs> workshop of yours. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I did a, a mini like... Um, exercise for the art free and like they really did enjoy it like they enjoyed it like even in our group they keep on saying peter pet what and i start laughing because <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing how you know music uh, can help recollect memory you know sound all of what you remember and i always say in my class you know I don't mind repeating the same thing over and over again because it helps me to remember more, mm -hmm. you know, if, if it also music helps me with reading, you know, um, the concentration span, you know, and remembering memories, music can help you. Uh, it can, we, we decided at Afra not to use the word trigger, but rather activate. It can, it can activate a lot of memories, whether, it's sad memories or good memories. And in those memories that you get from music, uh, it's either when they build you, they provoke you to go back to what we were talking about. In that incident, when you listen to that song and you fell in love, did you reconcile with that person because things did not work out? Does this song make you feel the same way you felt mm. then? And mm. Now, do you not believe in love because now this song is playing and mm. it's not the same, you know, moment that it's taking you through? Because I'm sure even for you, there are certain songs when you listen to and you're like, oh my gosh, I remember this song. It was my first song I listened to in varsity when I was doing this and this. Exactly. And, and how music helps us reconnect with our friends. Mm. Because now through music, I also write my friends on Facebook and say, do you remember a certain song? They're like, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, Tawazi, we must definitely do a reunion. Like all yeah. the great talks of 2005, we all meet and we sing that song together. So how it, it helps with the memory. And also I had one of my kids, my, my parents. Uh, so I take all of the kids that I teach as my own children. So she was really struggling with memory and speech, speech you know, she, she took long to, to actually start speaking. So her mom, she, she brought her to me and I started using music, you know. And immediately when she plays an instrument, she can sing. But when she, it, it comes to talking and everything else, she doesn't want to talk. But wow. when she can sing and then she says, and then anything that has to do with music, she will speak up. She's like, oh, I remember this song. This is the first one that you taught me with Uadi. But when she goes home, she has to be with her parents and do her normal, you know, child, then she keeps quiet, you know. So I've been also paying attention to that. How, how do I continue using music uh, as a therapeutic, you know, uh, music as therapy for children as well, you know. So 
I love yeah. what you said and how you described it so well. So why I'm also having this conversation with you and with other artists is as I was doing the research into how to keep your brain healthy um, and, and quite cohesively, what I realized was the research, let's, say, let's just take the research behind music and what music does to the brain. It activates the part of the brain involved in emotional processing, the limbic system, and the part of the brain responsible for processing of memories, the hippocampus. Mm -hmm. So obviously you mm -hmm. have all these emotions that you're processing attached to your memories, which is exactly what you've described, right? And so those are the mm -hmm. two parts of the brain that are activated. And you said something else about using music. And I also use music when I studied. And way before I understood what music was doing, I used music when I studied, particular types of mm -hmm. music. But mm -hmm. it activates a part of the brain that helps you to focus. Mm -hmm. It's called a salience mm -hmm. network. And so you can select the important information from the environment. Okay. And you've described all of it. And I think it's just that you understand the process of music and the magic of music so well mm -hmm, mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. it all kind of makes sense to you. You're very aware of that process. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. The other important thing that I'm doing was looking at healthy aging and how music helps healthy aging. And one of the important parts is to keep your brain active, you know, to constantly learn. And I thought of what you were doing and other musicians, artists, broad, broadly speaking. But I find what you're doing also would actually help in terms of that, because you're teaching a new skill to a lot of people. And at the same time, you're teaching a skill that helps with the emotional processing, memories, you know, so it's such a, a beautiful way to actually keep the brain engaged. Do you mm -hmm. find that? mostly it's younger people who want to learn or do you find that older people want to learn as well well uh from a rural perspective um uh, it's 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 both younger people and older people Wonderful. they show so much interest they show so much interest to a point that uh currently we're looking at a way of how do we like really train people to mass produce these instruments, you know? Brilliant. And because, I mean, honestly, I can't divide myself to be doing all the work, mm. you know? So I've been, I've been having this thing in mind that I've been, you know, I like to take time and process things before I even jump into any conclusion uh, to teach the teacher, you know? I've also come across not just like children, youth and the elderly of the community of the community i've also come across young professionals old professionals retired academics you know juveniles uh, old age homes um like a lot of spaces that i've been people like are really really like wanting to know about their own history and wanting to know about their own history through these musical instruments and knowing what these musical instruments are and what they mean to their lives. And that has resulted to an idea of having like um, something similar to the International Library of African Music at Rhodes, but then more accessible to the people, you know? Exactly. Because I don't want uh, our instruments, when I mean ours, every like, in, in the work that I do, I like to be very inclusive, mm. you know. I don't mm. want to be narrow about things, you know, mm. because Uwadi, um, Uwadi instrument alone, uh, it derives from uh, the Khoi people then because of the influence of the language and the cliques when mm. the Kosa people came down to interact with the Khoi, then this is how they shed uh, the, the instruments, you know. So I... I, I, I I, I, I don't want to, you know, be so much, you know, narrow about that. I want it to be inclusive. So I've, I've, I've had a lot of people, you know, being so interested. I get calls now and then. I get like a lot of WhatsApps. Chokazi, can, can you show me how to make my own instrument? Where do I get the trees? Where do, where do, how do I grow a calabash? Can I buy a calabash from you? You know, I always encourage people to, to do their own things by their own hands because, if you start spoon feeding people, then 
they would even want them to sing for you and not stop singing for themselves. So um, I want you yes, to sing for me, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can sing for you, but then we can also sing together. <laughs> so, no, but so, I agree. In my language called inner, inner ete, to take and give. You know, when you take, yeah. then you give. You give back. So yeah. yes, children, children, yo, oh, children. I would say they are the most exciting and excited so much fun to hang around with everything that they do like they are curious they want to touch they want to know they want to you know it's different also with youth because honestly i come from a very depressed society because also they also shy back you know mm. hence mm. in my film i'm talking about pro-blackness mm. i'm trying for them to be them be you mm. because you are you are 100% you and you are 100% at becoming yourself. You don't have to change anything. There's a lot of, when I deal with the youth, the youth like people my age, there's a lot of anxiety around the melanin, the identity and the looks, mm, you know. Mm, but immediately mm. when I, I come across a class of young people like me, they kind of feel the pressure of they need to change and look like me. You know, they need to, in order for someone to play an instrument, they have to look like Mtwagazi or they have to look like traditional. And I'm like, no, be you. And then some were even asking me, can I sing? Um, um, uh, can I play what and still sing gospel because I'm a Christian? I'm like, of course, of course, you know. Can I sing? Can I still play what and still do rap? And I'm like, I am most definitely interested in that. I would love to hear what comes up of yes. what. Because, you know, I don't want us to have boundaries and limits of how we want to explore, you know, and, and experiment uh, about, uh, and, and, and experiment in, in our own music, you know. There are no boundaries at all. And then with uh, the elderly people, mostly they wouldn't be so interested in making the instrument, but this is how they come in handy. Agiri, they, they stay in the, in the village most of the time, and they, it's mostly, in my village, it's mostly women that cultivate the land. So the idea of planting the calabashes, it's so exciting. Ah. Because I take the kids from the Early Childhood Development Center, which is Nolita, and then the, the higher, the, uh, the higher, what is it, a senior secondary school, which is Sonwabile. So I take the kids to these homesteads where they're going to take the seeds and plant. So the, the grannies, they help them out. They will be like, ah, you must, you must first prepare the soil. And then take your finger, you know, and try to stamp, to, you, to bore it into the soil. Then you put your seed and then you cover it with soil, put a little bit of water. So I see that kind of like intergenerational solidarity a lot. And it moves me when I see like a child from, I even had like a six month old child. He was there, he was sitting on the grass and the soil he was just playing with the soil and, you know, my son's age, he's five now, they were there up to 14. And then I took some from St. Matthew's High School. It's a girl's, uh, it's a girl's school. And then there were like a, about 15 to 20 elders from the community, middle age up to age. Uh, the oldest was 86, I think, you know. So it was so beautiful to see that, you know, happening at the same time and, you know, at the same place where children are working with their parents in the same space. For me alone, that was just like very exciting, you know? No, so I would say, yes, there's so much interest. There's so much interest, but there's less accessibility in terms of like getting, you know, people who want to facilitate in this kind of processes, you know? Yeah, so, yeah. I think what you're doing is really, really very empowering. Um, and I completely agree. I think again, as I was doing all this research in terms of brain health and how to keep the brain healthy, dementia prevention strategies, what I realized is that we have so much value in the knowledge systems that we already have in all our cultures and traditions in not just South Africa, but, but globally as well. And we don't place the same value on these knowledge systems that we do on other systems. And put and potentially harming ourselves in that process, you know, just by not recognizing the value of what we have and supporting what we have for, for I'm, 
I'm coming at it from a health perspective, but obviously it goes beyond health, you know, but completely agree in terms of, of mm-hmm. trying to center the process of, of health and healing on what we already have and how to support that. Mm-hmm. And that's why when I heard mm-hmm. of what you were doing, I was like, oh, wow, this is just incredible, actually. So, yeah, you have inspired me. And if you can teach me to <laughs> sing, I'm going to be like, oh, wow, you are, you you are genius. Have, <laughs> you have inspired me, too, because, I mean, I've been needing this kind of, you know, not just information, your presence in it, you Thank know, you. it's my first time having to come across, you know, because I, I didn't even know that you were vets. You did tell me in New York, all these things, but me being me, I meet people as people. <laughs> I don't really think that they should be doing what or not to be doing what, you know? So, and I'm like, wow, you know, you are encouraging me because, you know, some of the academic stuff, I would look at them and I would, I would look at these things and I'm like, hey, these things lack soul, man. There's no soul here. People are writing because they 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 have to write, they have I to agree. submit, and they have to put together nice words. Mm-hmm. And the words are really nice. You're like, yo, this is a nice rhyme, but it's empty. Mm-hmm. You know, there's no soul. For me, with the introduction that you were talking about, like the need for the impact of healing, you know, mentally, I was like, this has soul. I could feel that that particular part was written by you and it was it was coming from straight from your heart not just like the fact that you know how do you see people you know just mentally from what you are seeing i could feel mm. you in it, you know i Thank could you. i could also feel that you are doing this because it's needed you are not doing this because you are expected to do it you know mm. it really comes from your heart it's the oneness that you have every day it's it's your everyday not every day, but it's your now and again sleeping, crying yourself to sleep and being like, oh my gosh, when are people, you know, when is, when is this, you know, I felt that there's, I felt like there was like mixed emotions. There was also like some, so like not a negative frustration. It's normal to frustrate, I mean, to be frustrated, you know, but that, you know, I felt like when you were writing that just small p- paragraph, that it was it's for you it's necessary that we talk about these things and unfortunately where you are in in your spaces you're not surrounded by people who are ready to do this mm. you are surrounded by people who are running away from themselves and mm. you alone you are running towards yourself and it's hard it's hard you know it's very hard so i thank you because you know just like being you and then being in an academic space for me, it was easier to connect with the soul, you know. Mm. And I, I know I know a lot of academics and I'm honest with them. I'm like, <clears throat> I respect, I don't mean to diminish and disrespect the fact that you are an academic, but can I deal with a human being, please? <laughs> so with you, I feel like I'm dealing with a human being. I don't feel like I have to be academically correct or politically correct. I'm speaking from my heart. And I like to speak about what I know. I don't like to speak about things I don't know or I'm hoping to know. Hence, like, if I don't know something, I don't know it. And if I don't know what something means, I don't know. And I wish to know, you know. So I'm really grateful for this. This is like, I was even coming to a point to say, I mean, this could be for a later conversation. Mm. But I wanted to translate all of this into language, like, you know, isikosa. No. I would love that. Yeah, for people to have an understanding mm. because one of the barriers is language, you know. Mm, I agree. You know, so I would love for pe- for, for my children to, of course, I mean, because I speak the language quite, okay, I'm okay, I'm not that perfect. But then I, I think a lot of things like um, could be like simplified, you know. Mm. I, I did. I did build into that energy that this is not just a conversation for us to have, but I'm looking forward to what's, what's going to come in the future out of this conversation. Yeah. I agree. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Bunkiwe. That really, again, I say it again, was, was inspiring. And, you know, all the tools were there, the tools necessary to live well self-awareness, accessing relaxation, understanding what we need to overcome 
tragedy, but also how to embrace opportunity, how to thrive. Um, what a beautiful example of tapping into our heritage, our cultures, our traditions in order to do this. You know, and it got me thinking, what would happen if we all started to listen to the wadi or play the mbira? How would we transform individually and as, as a society? What would we learn about ourselves and each other? I hope you join me for my next conversation. It will be in two weeks' time. And we will continue these interesting discussions. Thank you.
right? 